Okay, so we are going to now um, be served by our dear brother Jack here, and the um, title for his discourse is The Love of Christ. makes me think of uh, the dear brethren all down through the gospel age, how they would speak to great numbers of people on the hillside, out in the wilderness. They had to project their voices because they didn't have microphones, they didn't have the modern technology that we have, so we have to be prepared to project their voices if we need to. Precious Jesus, how I love thee, and I know thy love is mine. All my little life I give thee, use it, Lord, in ways of thine. Use my warmest, best affections, use my memory, mind, and will. Then with all thy loving spirit, all my emptied nature fill. All of earth and all of heaven, all I want, I find in thee. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, thou art all the world to me. Hymn number 240, Precious Jesus, stanza number one. You perhaps remember Brother Jolly spoke about hypocritical singing. And so when we sing our hymns, we should desire to sing them not only with our voices, but with our hearts. If we sing only with our voices, but our hearts are far from him, we are guilty of hypocritical singing. That sounds rather harsh, but what a blessing it is to be able to sing these hymns with our voices and with our hearts. My subject, the love of Christ. And I would like to use as a text 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. I'm going to read from the King James Version, and it reads, For the love of Christ, Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live for themselves or unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. I'd like to break these two verses down into four different parts verse 14 into two parts, and verse 15 into two parts. The first part, for the love of Christ constraineth us. What do we mean by the love of Christ? Well, in our manna book for September 30th, this verse 14 is our text. And I appreciate Brother Johnson's comments where he said this expression, love of Christ, can mean three different things. Number one, the love that the Lord Jesus has in his heart. The second, the love that we have in our hearts for him. And the third, the love that we have in our hearts like unto that which he has in his heart. And he went on to explain that the latter two meanings are what is meaning meant by the love of Christ in verse 14. In other words, it means the love that we have in our hearts for Christ, and then the even broader meaning, the love that we have in our hearts 
like unto the love that Jesus has in his heart. And I appreciate Brother Bob Branconier's thoughts on the mark. And that that third definition then, the love that we have in our hearts like unto Jesus is love for God, Christ, our brethren, the world of mankind, and our enemies. And to reiterate what Brother Bob said, how that first quarter mark is duty love toward God, Christ, the brethren, the world, and our enemies. The second quarter mark is disinterested love toward God and Christ. The third quarter mark, disinterested love toward the brethren. And the fourth quarter mark, disinterested love toward the world and our enemies. Brethren, the love of Christ constraineth us. Now, if you investigate, the word constrain has a double thought. The first thought is drawing together. And the second thought is, once it's been drawn together, is to hold together. And so the love of Christ draws us, and then it holds us. Now, the Apostle Paul, in speaking to the Corinthians, was recounting his activities in the service of Christ. And he indicated that there were some that viewed his course of service and suffering for Christ as that it was an indication that he was an, of an unbalanced mind, that he was foolish to suffer for Christ's sake. But he went on to explain that that was not the case, that he indeed had a sounder mind than he had ever had before. That he felt himself bound to Christ, constrained by the love of Christ to love him and all who were Christ's with a pure heart. To paraphrase, it's like the Apostle Paul is saying, I am so closely drawn to Christ that I have the same sympathetic love for others that Jesus had. As he had laid down his life for the brethren, so would I. He followed in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus. Not only the church, but all of the consecrated, including us here today, are bound by the cords of love. You know, the Lord never compels acceptance of his favors. He offers his favors freely, but he will not force us to accept his favors. But he constrains us by his love for us and our love for him by his grace and by all his promises in Christ Jesus to those who love him and Christ in righteousness and in truth. For those who are feeling after God, he first draws to repentance of their sins. He then points to Jesus and offers Jesus as one that we can ex exercise faith in. And when we do that, along with our repentance for our sins, he grants us the great favor of tentative justification. And for the tentatively justified, he continues to draw on to the next step, on to consecration. And for the consecrated, he continues to draw through that process of sanctification, which is the faithful carrying out of our consecration, even on to death. I read something in the Truth Writings not long ago that impressed me greatly. It said that for those that are feeling after God, 
He makes our course favorable. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer, but He makes our choice for God more favorable to our hearts and our minds than to choose another course. And if you look back on your life, perhaps you have seen that. Perhaps you've seen you've come to a dividing point in the road. But God always influences us to take the right path. He never will coerce our will, our free moral agency, but he will make the right course, the favorable course, for those that have a pure heart and are seeking after him. The class that God is now seeking needs no stripes. They need no punishments to constrain their obedience. God does not want to force obedience. But he will constrain us by his love. That's how he appeals to us. By his love, his grace, his goodness, and his mercy. The love of Christ still today draws and holds one here and one there even against all the subtle and deceptive influences that we find in this evil day. And we are in an evil day. There are temptations bombarding us continuously. And yet, for those one here and one there, his love constrains them. But it's not only love. The power which constrains also is the truth. It's the truth and the spirit of the truth. And the more clearly we can discern the truth, the more it will be allowed to influence us. Many are constrained instead of by the truth, by fear. During the dark ages, and even since, even to today, some are constrained by fear of punishment, fear of eternal torment, fear of going into the second death. But there's also the fear of man, the fear of displeasing a human being. The fear to put the truth above organization and movement. Why should this love constrain us? You know, the Apostle Paul was the great logician. He was the great reasoner. And he goes on and gives his logical reasoning in the second part of our verse, 14. He says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If one died for all, he's preaching the ransom, sacrifice of our Lord Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, verse 6. Some read this verse, and they read it this way. If one died for a few. Some read it, if one died for for some. But what does it read? It reads, if one died for all. As Brother Jolly used to say, A-L-L. Not few, not some. Hebrews 2 verse 9 reads, He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He, meaning Christ, by the grace of God, we all have to remember that Jesus died as the ransom sacrifice for Father Adam and for all of us in Father Adam's loins. But we could never forget that God, the Heavenly Father, is the great author of that plan of establishing the ransom. And so Jesus is not only the Savior of the church, 
but he's also the Savior of the world, each in their own due time. Now the wise of this world deny the value of the precious blood of Christ. But for those like ourselves who have had our eyes opened, the precious blood of Jesus is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1 verse 16. It is the very hub of our message. The cross of Christ is the basis of reconciliation between God and man. It has been the basis of reconciliation between God and the church, and it will be the basis of reconciliation between God and the world. We go on, then we're all dead. The entire world is legally dead under just sentence of death. From God's standpoint, the world has already lost life. All are dying. All of us are more dead than alive. As the Bible puts it, we're dead in trespasses and sins. You know, do you know anybody that has lived 150 years ago? There's no exceptions. Every human being who has lived, with perhaps one exception of Enoch, has gone into the death sentence. No one is spared. We're all headed for the tomb. Now, to live however, in its full import means a great deal. To live like Father Adam and Mother Eve, they had life in perfect measure before sin entered. What percent of life do we have? Ten percent? At the most, perhaps? I don't think we can conceive of what it would be like to have perfect life. But the law of God demanded as a just penalty the life of the transgressor, Adam. And that included all of Adam's posterity. We are all heirs of death because Adam's life was forfeited. But what a blessed thing, as we've heard about the wisdom of God, it was that we're all dead in Adam, rather than all of us having stood trial on our own. For that allowed Jesus to die for Father Adam, and that includes all of us who have descended from Adam. All are either actually dead and buried, or under the sure sentence of death. I was talking to uh, Brother Parkinson earlier, and we were talking about the thought that uh, all of the people, all the billions of people that are living in the world right now are probably about 20% of those who have already gone into the tomb. So about perhaps one-fifth of the world of mankind that has ever lived is living today. And the four-fifths have already gone into the tomb. And so man's condition is scripturally called death even before he enters the tomb. From the day a baby is born, the death process begins. Like a criminal who is accused of first degree murder and sentenced to death, he's on death row, he is referred to as a dead man even though the execution has not transpired. And so that's the condition of the world of mankind. Now let us go on to the next uh, verse, verse uh, 15, and it reads, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Now if you notice in the King James Version that word that is in parentheses, is it not? And so it should read, And he died for all, and he, Christ, 
died for all. Paul again, for the second time now, is re-emphasizing the doctrine of the ransom. And notice again, he says, and he, Christ, died for all, not just for a few or for some, but for all, A-L-L. That they which live. Who are they which live? Well, during the gospel age, when the high calling was open, those that consecrated their life unto God became vitalizedly justified and spirit begotten. And so they were justified to life through faith in Jesus' ransom sacrifice and due to their consecration to God. They gained life through faith in His blood. Were they made actually perfect in their bodies? No. But they were reckonedly alive from God's standpoint in Christ. Now we are not justified to life as the church was or as all the spirit begotten were. However, we enjoy the privilege of tentative justification and all the benefits that it brings. Forgiveness of sins, being covered by the tentative robe of Christ's righteousness, to have friendship and fellowship with God, and to have all of the encouragements from Him to live holy lives. One of the servants spoke about those of us who are consecrated between the ages, when we consecrate, no, it doesn't enhance our tentative justification, but it puts a seal upon our tentative justification. It binds us even more to Christ. And it says, should not henceforth live unto themselves. How reasonable the Apostle Paul is if any man will be a disciple of Jesus, let him renounce his own self-will to live contrary to his own preferences, instead to do according to the divine will, instead of his own will. The par uh, one with a proper heart condition responds to God's grace by desiring to do God's will. It's only reasonable that God, the author of our salvation in Jesus, our ransom sacrifice, our life giver, that we would then in turn dedicate our lives to Him who has done so much for us. Oh yes, we seek to please God. We are to know God's will, second, do God's will, and third, love God's will. We need to study to know what God's will is. Then we need to perform His will to serve, in particular, the brethren, to lay down our life for the brethren, and to give a witness to the world. But the most important work of all is that work within ourselves. And so the third and most important is to love God's will. Cut, irregardless of what suffering we may be called upon to endure. Consecration allows God to use His power and influence to operate upon us, our hearts, our minds, and our wills. It gives us a new human heart, mind, and will, leading to works of obedience self-denial, self-sacrifice, that we could not do of our own power without His Holy Spirit within us, enlightening us and guiding us. Now, we might ask the question, does the Lord look with displeasure upon one who seeks to avoid sin and which recognizes the merit of Christ, but 
decides not to consecrate, oh no. God is pleased with those who repent of their sins and by faith accept Jesus. He's more pleased with those that take those steps than if they had not taken those steps. But he's even more pleased with those that go on to consecrate their lives. For that's the reasonable outcome and the main purpose for our tentative justification. It is only a reasonable service. Some read into that scripture it, that it's an unreasonable service. But that's looking at it from the worldly standpoint. Continuing on now, the last part of that 15th verse, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That first part, but unto him which died for them. And so we are to live for Christ who died for us, this is the active side of consecration being pictured here. And we could put it all together with three words. Study, spread, and practice. Study God's Word. Not only read and study to gain a knowledge and understanding of God's Word, but to meditate upon His Word, to con it over and over again in our hearts and in our minds. And as we hold that meditation of God's Word upon our hearts. We love it more and more, His Word. As far as spreading God's truth, it really doesn't matter whether we're given small or great opportunities of service. Because all is a privilege from God. And he has even said in his word that those that are faithful in that which is least shall be faithful in that which is greater. Those who are faithful in the least service given, if they're faithful in that, will be given great opportunities of service in God's kingdom. But as we said, the greatest work is the work within us. Brother Bob talked about we need to develop disinterested love. Yes, we have to develop faith and obedience, but disinterested love. And I propose not to be dogmatic, but it would appear that he would prefer to see us develop at least to that third quarter mark, love for the brethren. For does not the Bible say that if we love the brethren, we have passed from death unto life? And if we can go on and develop that perfect love for even our enemies, even better yet, perfect untested love. We ask, well, when will it be tested? Obviously, we will need to eventually crystallize love, but we cannot do it in this life. Apparently, God does not give either the youth worthies or the CECs the experiences to crystallize perfect love love. But there will be trials in the millennium, especially in the little season, severe trials, that will then put the finishing, crystallizing touch on love, disinterested love. Brethren, we owe to God and to Christ a debt far greater than we could ever pay. We wouldn't even want to think about that we have to do so. His grace to us is infinitely greater than we can ever give. The most we can do is just to give our little all to show them God and Christ our gratitude for their kind favor. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20 For ye are bought with a price Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are bought with the precious blood of Christ who died on the cross, and he would have died on the cross if it was only you or only me. 
James 4, verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Have we not all experienced that in our lives, especially during times of trial? Has he ever broken his promise? No. Philippians 4, verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Yes, consecration gives the peace of God. It's not only peace with God, which tentative justification brings, but the peace of God, the same kind of peace that God has in his heart. Is he ever ruffled? He is in perfect peace, no matter what kind of catastrophe might seem to endanger his plan. No. He is in perfect peace, and we have that same privilege. The final part of our text and rose again. Why did the apostle include this? I believe he wanted to emphasize that Christ's resurrection is all as important as his death. Had he died for us but not risen again from the dead, we would still be lost. We don't have a dead Savior. We have a living Savior who has ministered unto God's people all the way down through the Gospel age onto the present time. And He will continue His ministry into the millennial age, mediatorial reign of Christ. The work of grace for the world will be made known unto all mankind the gracious character of God's wisdom, power, justice, and love and his provision for the salvation of all. The world, the willing and obedient, will have their hearts transformed from the depravity of sin to the perfection of character as images of God. And this transformation of their wills will give them even something that we don't receive today. As they are obedient, their obedience will be accompanied by gradual physical transformation. So the more obedient they become, the more up the highway of holiness towards physical perfection they will come. Also mentally, artistically, morally, and religiously until all the blemishes of sin and all hereditary inclinations thereby will leave them into the image and likeness of God. Because they will have learned the various terrible effects of sin and the contrary wonderful results of righteousness. So, dear brethren, if we allow the love of Christ to constrain us until we finish our course in this life or until the kingdom begins, we will be given a portion of that glorious ministry toward the world in the next age. We will be given the privilege of assisting the ancient and youthful worthies, as they minister unto the world as they go up the highway of holiness. And in closing, I would like to read our text again from 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. And may the Lord add his blessing. Thank you, Brother Jack. It's always wonderful to hear how much our Father,